the mother of great universities and museums, libraries and medical schools. She's famed for industry and commerce. Her majestic ocean queens, launched from ultra-modern shipyards, carry her renown across the seven seas. While the Scots are proud of this modern culture, they take equal pride in historic tradition. Landmarks dating back to the pre-Christian era are still preserved. Centuries past, Roman legions built a defensive rampart along Scotland's frontier to ward off fierce counterattacks of Scottish clans. It was named Hadrian's Wall after the Roman emperor, but it stands today as a monument to the dauntless spirit of the Scot. This spirit still endures and is symbolized by a strange and haunting music In this place of heath and heather, the Highlander pursues his rugged way of life. His cattle wear a double raincoat, which is always in style in a land of cold and mist. While life in the Highlands can at times be lonely, it's even lonelier in the scattered islands of the Inner and Outer Hebrides. For the isolated people on these islands, contact with the outer world is made by little channel boats called puffers. They ply the choppy seas and use any rock-free cove for a port, bringing everything the islander needs. is always eager to meet the boat, there's plenty of time. For the puffer will have to sit it out until the next tide sets her afloat. For the crew, there's a muckle amount of cargo that must be put ashore, despite the possessive attitude of the ship's mascot. of his Clydesdale mare belies the islander's eagerness for human contact. This is the day he's been looking forward to. Right now, there's work to be done. But afterwards, he'll hear news of folks on all the other islands. What do you ken of the MacLeods on the island of Barra? And the MacGregors of Butte? What are the McGiverns of Rum and the McCrackens of Egg? How are the McMullins of Mull and the Mackenzies of Cow? He wants all the news of fish and of feed, the aging of whiskey, the harvest of oats, of politics, lobsters, the raising of goats, the peat bogs of Raze, the wheat crop in Sande, and Ariske, Stornoway, Mingile. Well, anyway, he'll hear all about it when captain and crew join him for supper ashore before they catch the outgoing tide. On these lonely islands, trading livestock, as well as news, is another chance for companionship. On trading days, some set out with a canny deal in mind. Others take a bullheaded attitude. Aberdeen Angus is for beef. The Ayrshire is for cheese. I'll trade you a couple of Highland sheep for bonny calves like these. The Scotsman delights in bidding and barter, in offer and refusal. He also knows the right moment for saying, I.
But in the end, all parties are satisfied, each convinced that he got the best of the bargain. Well, if you can't lead a calf to market, you can't trade him off. Where neighbors are rare, neighborliness finds its richest meaning. The opportunity for chatting and song is offered in the job of shrinking homespun woolens. After soaking, the cloth is kneaded and tumbled to soften the fiber and set the weave. This is called walking the cloth. people still find ways to scrape up a living. Even the stones yield a harvest. This crop of the rocks is called crottle, and it's used for coloring wool. After staining and drying, the wool is ready for spinning into tweed. comes from the old name for homespun, twill, pronounced twill by the Scottish and misspelled tweed by the English. These skillful folk, by dint of proverbial Scottish thrift, have created a sound economy on otherwise barren islands. The art of weaving is said to have been invented by the Celtic peoples. And a label that says Harris Tweed, homespun and woven by crofters of the island of Lewis and Harris, is a certificate of the very finest in tweeds. The Scots' need for good fellowship is best satisfied at a Cayley, a get-together for friends and neighbors who come around at the drop of a tam shanter the door is wide open, and harmony is the password. Thank you, say. Shall you say she is? While English is sometimes spoken, Gaelic is preferred in both conversation and song. When it's too crowded for a Scottish reel, there's always elbow room for a solo Highland flink. My heart's in the highlands, sang the poet, but it's also out at sea, where Scottish fishermen pursue elusive schools of herring. Signs and portents appear favorable, the gill nets are set. The 
seine is kept afloat by airtight canvas buoys called bucks. Once the mile-long trap is out, the ship drifts with the tide. A constant watch is kept, which sometimes lasts till dawn. Suddenly, there's a sign that a school has been netted. The gill net is a most efficient snare. It takes a vigorous shaking to release the herring from its meshes. worried about the few that fall back into the sea. For those that got away, didn't. The canny Scott has a special net for recapturing just such fugitives from the herring barrel. Heavily loaded, the boat races for port and the fish market. First one in gets the highest prices. Scottish waters yield other rewards. A dome of solid rock, called Ailsa Craig, furnishes an abundant supply of fine-grained granite. Jagged chunks blasted from the face of Ailsa Craig are rough hewn and prepared for shipment to the factory on the mainland. This factory is so unique, there's only one other like it in the entire world. For here, the granite blocks are turned into curling stones. Curling is similar to bowling on ice and is a favorite winter sport of the Scotsman. In olden times, a stone often weighed well over 100 pounds. Today, regulations limit the weight to 45 pounds. Each stone is precision turned and polished to a mirror sheen. The finished product is shipped to every country in the world where curling is played. When the garment of winter covers the glen and sheet ice can support the weight of man and stone, a rink is traced on the hard blue skin of the loch. Sweeping, or souping as it's called, prevents melted ice from slowing the stone's progress. According to tradition, curling is best when the wind is snell, the ice black, the clothes thick, and the toddy hot. The Scotsman's love for tradition is evident in a famous summer pageant called the Braw Lads Gathering.
It's a pilgrimage to historic sites to pay tribute to heroic deeds. One stop in this yearly procession is at Abbotsford. This castle, built by Sir Walter Scott, is preserved as a national shrine. The provost, or mayor of the town, together with the Bra Lad and Bra Lassie, pay their respects to Sir Walter's great-great-great-granddaughters, the ladies Maxwell Scott. After a loving cup in honor of Scotland's greatest novelist, the pilgrims proceed to other historical shrines. Other seasons, other customs. This is a festive time. The air is heady with the tang of fall. And the ears of the young are attuned to mysterious murmurs in the woods. Today the spell is even more potent, for this is the 31st of October. Long before the Christian era, here in Scotland, Halloween was born. Originally, it was the Druid New Year, when all spirits were released to work their pranks on mortals. A raid on the good-natured farmer's cart yields turnips, used instead of pumpkins for jack-o'-lanterns. In the words of the old Scottish nursery rhyme, this is the nick to Halloween, when all the witches might be seen, some of them black, some of them green, some of them like a turkey bean. Dark, and goblin masks are raised to reveal familiar faces again. But the relief is only momentary. Enter the Druid priest with oak leaf crown. The magic of his hazel wand unlocks the realm of spirits from a long departed past. Thus he rules the ritual according to the rites of ancient lore. Dukin for apples, the children call it. Catch one and you enter the enchanted kingdom even if you have to be pushed in. To know your fortune, all you need is an egg, a needle, and a witch woman. She can see the shape of things to come in the weird formations of egg white in water. What'll it be for wee Maggie McTavish? A journey to town? And you killed, perhaps. Only the witch woman can tell. Three bowls of colored water predict future mates. Will young Donald McDonald take a maiden to wife? Nay, the finger of fate points at bachelorhood. And lucky Laurie McNeil. Ah, there's a six-foot Highlander in her future. Mashed potatoes called champa tatties hold magic charms. A ring means an early marriage. A blank means nothing. A coin, money in the pocket. Yes, you've got a fortune on the tip of your tongue if you don't swallow it.
Scotland rings with the music of the Highland reel and the laughter of children. But the voice that best expresses the Scotsman issues from a small bag made of sheepskin, the bagpipe. It's the Scottish national musical instrument. Instrument of torture, a tin-eared trader once called it, but he didn't stay in Scotland long. Odd as it may sound, a bagpipe does have to be tuned. The bagpipe is the eloquent spokesman of a way of life. Its droning lament accompanies the Scot from cradle to grave. It is his lullaby, the love song to his lassie, the affirmation of his marriage vow. Piper's proudest moment comes during Edinburgh's yearly festival. Side by side with valiant brothers at arms, in this historic castle courtyard, Scotland's regimental pipers stage a bagpipe extravaganza, the biggest spectacle of its kind known to man. of the bagpipe stirs the Scotsman's pulse. It sustains him in battle, exalts him in victory, keens over the fallen wherever Scottish regiments have fought and died. This voice, so sweet to the Scotsman's ears, proclaims that his foot is on his native heath. His eyes can see the present in his past, and his heart is in the Highlands. <laughs> 